Was that the longest smackdown I've ever recorded? Quite possibly. Thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring a section of this video. Get smarter at maths and physics through solving problems at brilliant.org slash Simon Clark. The comment section on YouTube is a dangerous place at the best of times, but when you make videos about a controversial, for some reason, topic like climate change, then it tends to get, um, more intense? In this video series, I have been looking through the comments on my videos about climate change and reacting and responding to some of the points that have been raised. So let's do some more of that. What a load of crap. Tell me what percentage of warming, as if warming isn't like a, 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 ter a term, like a scientific term, warming. Tell me what percentage of warming is humanity responsible for? By some people's estimates, actually more than 100%, which, let me explain. So climate scientists will look at two kinds of forcings on the global climate. They'll look at the human forcing, CO2 emissions, for example, and also the natural forcing. So that can be uh, background changes in, uh, the, you know, the, the us coming out of the last ice age. It could be changes in solar forcing, any number of factors which, you know, do contribute to the global average temperature. In order to accurately model the observed changes in the Earth's climate over the past century, we have to account for human interference. There is absolutely no doubt that humans have influenced the climate and the amount of warming that has taken place due to humans is approximately 100%. The extra uncertainty on top of that is the natural forcings. So it's possible that the Earth would have warmed slightly in the absence of humans, but also it's possible that the Earth might have cooled in the absence of humans. In which case, humans are actually responsible for more than 100% of the observed warming because cooling would have happened if there were no humans which is not something that we are totally sure about. We are sure that humans have warmed the climate. We're not sure quite how, whether it's 100, 102 or 98%. It's in Elon Musk hands now, our space Jesus. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what? <laughs> Mentally unstable people, it's the weather. I'm sure this is something that a lot of people do understand, but this is something I see frequently enough that I should probably explicitly address it. There is a definite difference between climate and weather. Weather is the short-term variations in atmospheric parameters, so rain, sun, cloudy, whereas climate is the long-term average of those quantities. And the change in climate is the long-term change in weather, effectively. The problem is that humans are very bad at detecting small long-term changes, especially when we have large short-term variations. So the variance, certainly in the UK, uh, from day to day in temperatures and the amount of sun that we have is far, far larger than any annual increase that we would see due to anthropogenic forcing on the climate. It's very easy to A, conflate climate and weather because they are related, but definitely distinct topics. But also as humans, just difficult to actually believe that there is a, a slow, small background change that when added up over the course of a couple of decades or a century is gonna be very significant. By the way, if you are enjoying this video, please do give it a like. As I said in the last video, uh, these videos that I make about climate tend to be targeted by uh, YouTube bots in some cases and uh, posted on uh, conspiracy websites. So they tend to get flooded with downvotes. So if you have learned something, if you are enjoying it, then do pop it a like and it helps the channel undo some of the damage that the algorithm can inflict on it. Anyway, back to the comments. So the climate models are proof of human cause. Are those the same models that failed to predict the climate of the last 20 years? This is a very common argument that you'll find being used by climate skeptics, that the models used by atmospheric scientists have no relation to reality and they're unable to predict what's happening. This is an interesting argument because it's completely wrong. The global circulation and climate models that atmospheric scientists use have been shown to accurately predict the changes in the Earth's atmosphere and also actually in the Earth's ocean. And there's two ways that we can be pretty confident about that. Firstly is forecasting, which is where you make a prediction of what's going to happen in the future, and then you have to wait for however long it is that you forecast into the future to see how accurate you've been, and the models have done a very good job of that. But you can also do hindcasting, which is to start at the present, and instead of iterating forwards in the future, you iterate backwards, which is super simple to do in a climate model. You literally just change the time step from positive to negative, and then you go backwards in time. And so starting from your initial conditions and uh, given data about, for example, CO2 concentrations changing over time, you can see if your model accurately predicts further back into the past. And global climate models have done a very good job of predicting right back to 1900. So 
this idea that client models uh, don't match reality is simply not true. It's one of these lies that just gets stated often enough that people just kind of start to believe it because they never check. To come back to something else in this comment though, that the climate models are proof of human cause, um, in a sense yes, because climate models are able to disentangle what's called natural forcing, so that could be changes in the sun's intensity or volcanic eruptions or what have you, but also then the human uh, forcings, so things like carbon dioxide emissions, and it's been very clearly shown that you need to account for the human forcings in order to make your model match reality. If you put only natural forcings into your model, then it doesn't produce the observed warming. The fact of the matter is that climate scientists using an anthropogenic principle that, and that humans are forcing the climate are able and have been able to predict what's going to happen in the atmosphere. Climate skeptics, without accounting for human influence, have not. And actually, one further thing, um, there's a frequent criticism leveled at these models that uh, climate scientists always overhype um, and overestimate how much warming will happen. And there's obviously uncertainty in any form of prediction. This is actually why climate scientists do so many forms of prediction, so we get an ensemble forecast of lots of different climate models with ever so slightly different tuned models. But in actual fact, a lot of the time we have been underestimating. So if you look at Arctic sea ice extent, it has been collapsing at a rate faster than climate scientists have on the whole predicted. Ditto for sea level rise. The sea level has been rising, rather the sea level rise has been accelerating at a greater rate than scientists would say. It's still within the error bars, but at the upper end. So that indicates that our predictions are actually underestimating the anthropogenic impact on the climate. Was that the longest smackdown I've ever recorded? Quite possibly. Simon, I highly suspect that deep inside your flawed brain you realise just how full of you are. We, the discerning minds of this planet, now know without equivocation that all of the planets in the Terran system have had the beaten out of them. This is due to the sun's solar minimum opening the door to galactic radiation, as well as waves of energy from belching black holes? The region of space we are now in contains areas of highly charged energy, and in some cases and in some instances radiates temperatures of over 10,000 degrees F. My friends, when you pass a rocky snowball through an oven, the top and bottom melt first. I can't believe I read a comment the other day that said education was overfunded. Someone clearly hasn't heard of CO2 saturation. So this is actually a more scientifically uh, interesting idea to bring up, this concept of CO2 saturation. This is the idea that CO2 in the atmosphere already absorbs basically all of the uh, thermal energy that is emitted by the surface. So if you're adding more CO2 to the atmosphere, you're not going to cause it to absorb more of that radiation. It's already at its maximum or it's saturated. And this is almost correct, but it's missing quite an important fundamental of atmospheric science. So to break this down, firstly, does CO2 already absorb all of the infrared radiation basically that is emitted by the Earth's surface? Yes, that's true. So by adding more CO2, you're not going to be increasing the amount of infrared radiation that's absorbed at the Earth's surface by CO2. True, that's also correct. Therefore, by adding more CO2 to the atmosphere, you can't cause more global warming? No. The way that CO2 absorbs infrared radiation in the atmosphere is a bit like this. So the Earth's surface radiates infrared radiation, and that then is absorbed by CO2 that's close to the surface. And I should point out, this has always happened. There's always been a greenhouse effect present in the Earth's atmosphere. It's just that humans have somewhat um, intensified it. The layer of the atmosphere above the Earth's surface then re-emits that radiation as infrared radiation. But then there's another layer of atmosphere above that where as it's getting thinner there is less CO2 present. And so maybe a little bit of the infrared will escape but it's still largely reabsorbed and then re-emitted. And this process happens over and over and over again until you reach a section in the atmosphere where the atmosphere above you is so thin that there's not enough CO2 to absorb the infrared radiation and so it escapes to space. The crucial thing is that the amount of energy the Earth gives out is then dependent on how hot that layer of the atmosphere is. And as humans have been adding more CO2 to the atmosphere, it's basically raised that emitting or that radiating height. And crucially, this is all happening in the lowest part of the atmosphere called the troposphere, which is the part of the atmosphere where temperatures decrease as you get higher. So 
As you add more CO2 to the atmosphere, that means that the uh, temperature of the emitting layer, as it gets higher and higher in the atmosphere because we've added more CO2, the temperature of that layer decreases, which means the Earth's been emitting less energy into space, which causes the energy imbalance that results in global warming and climate change. So while it is correct to say that the CO2 absorption at the surface is saturated, it's not correct to say that it is for the whole atmosphere. Which produces more CO2, volcanoes or human activity? Wait a minute, this isn't a YouTube comment at all. This is from Brilliant. Brilliant have been a long time supporter of this channel and they have very kindly agreed to sponsor this video, which I'm very pleased about because Brilliant is all about scientific literacy and learning through solving problems. They have a huge variety of courses on their site, ranging from maths to science to computer science, and they're expanding it all the time. This question actually came from the wiki that's built into Brilliant on climate change, which includes questions that you can interact with, talking about the science of climate change, but also talking about some of the people that dispute the science and the idea of scientific literacy. <clears throat> In this era where everybody's having to do everything from home, including learning, then Brilliant, if you're interested in science, if you're interested in maths, is the perfect resource. I honestly wish that it was around when I was at university, when I was at school, because this would have helped me in my education so much. You can use Brilliant completely for free, but if you would like to upgrade to a premium membership and get access to the expertly written courses, then go to brilliant.org slash Simon Clark, and the first 200 people to do so will get 20% off their premium annual subscription. That's it for this video. Thank you very much for watching. As I already said, if you enjoyed it, if you learned something, do pop it a like. And if you'd like to see more of this kind of content, then do subscribe to the channel and let me know in the comments what kind of things you'd like me to talk about in future videos. Thank you again for watching. I'll see you in the next one.